All right. Who's ready to do this? Are you ready? Winter cycling. We're going to talk about it tonight. I'm Darren Elf from BicycleTurningPro.com. And, uh, yeah, so thanks for tuning in, everybody. Um, this is going to be a live one-hour webinar or so. I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes about winter cycling, what clothes to wear, what kind, how to equip your bicycle, um, how to ride properly in rain, ice, and snow. And then after I finish that, I'm going to open it up uh, for questions and answers. You guys can ask me any question you want about winter cycling, bicycle touring, uh, anything else, um, and I will try to answer. And if I don't know the answer, I will find out an answer after the webcast is over and I'll, I'll let you know the answer as soon as I can. So um, that's it. Uh, I'm not going to wear this silly hat the whole time. I just thought it would be funny to start that way. So um, let me take that off. It's getting really hot too. So that's one of the secrets that I'm going to be talking about here in just a moment is um, taking off and removing your clothes in order to regulate your body temperature while you ride throughout the winter. So um, I'll talk about that later, but uh, it's too hot with that hat on, and so I took it off and put on something colder. Um, I guess I should start maybe with a brief introduction to who I am and why I'm interested in winter cycling, um, and why you should be too. Excuse me, I just made some tea, so I'm sipping on some tea here. It's really hot, <laughs> still. Um, so yeah, my name is Darren Alf. I run the website at BicycleTouringPro.com and since 2001 uh, I have been bicycle touring all over the world. Um, I've bicycle toured across dozens of countries and multiple continents and since 2007 um, I've been running the website at BicycleTouringPro.com and helping people like you uh, plan, prepare for, and execute their very own bicycle touring adventures. Uh, so uh, most of the webcasts I've done in the past have been about bicycle touring. Uh, what to pack, how to plan a safe route, uh, where to go, that kind of thing. Um, but tonight I'm doing something special in that um, I'm going to be talking about winter cycling and riding your bike in the rain, uh, you know, cold, ice, and snow. So um, that's what we'll be talking about tonight. The reason I became interested in winter cycling is because uh, in 2006 I moved from sunny Southern California to the mountains of Utah and for the first time in my life I uh, had to deal with snow and, and extremely cold temperatures and uh, growing up in Southern California this just was never something that I had to deal with before. I'd probably only seen snow once or twice before moving to Utah so it was quite a change for me and shortly after moving to Utah uh, to make it even harder for myself, I guess, uh, or more fun, depending on how you look at it, I decided to give up my car. I decided that, uh, hey, I could get around this place without a car. And so, um, you know, summer, winter, whatever, I was getting around town on a bicycle. If I needed to go to the supermarket, I rode my bike. If I went to the bank, I rode my bike. If I wanted to go visit some friends, I rode my bike. And so I learned a lot. Uh, getting around for multiple years in the winter on a bicycle. And I also realized while doing this that I was one of a few people in town that were actually getting around on bike. I live in a big bicycle town. There's over 400 miles of bike paths in my town. But when winter hits, most people, the great majority, just leave their bikes at home and don't continue to ride, despite the fact that it is completely rideable out there. So, um... That's kind of why I wanted to talk about the webcast tonight. It's also why I wrote this book called Winter Cycling, um, which you can learn more about at wintercyclingbook.com. Um, and basically the book and what we'll be talking about tonight is basically a uh, all the lessons that I learned about riding your bike in the wintertime. So... Um, that's kind of how I got started with winter cycling is I moved to Utah and, and commuted locally for several years and then I started combining my winter cycling that I did at home with these long-distance bicycle tours that I had done for for several years and 
in 2009, or no, 2007, sorry, uh, I moved to Switzerland. I spent two months uh, living in Lucerne, Switzerland, and then spent another two months or so cycling around Switzerland in the ice and snow uh, during the months of January and February, which is like right in the middle of winter time in Switzerland. So I spent two months doing that. Um, this last year I went to Iceland for a month and also conducted several, I was in Eastern Europe for several months during the winter, pretty much the whole winter this last year, bicycle touring across Romania, Moldova, Transnistria, Ukraine, Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, all during the winter time. And, um, and not only was it easy to do, in, in most instances, it was a lot of fun. And uh, so, yeah, the main reason I guess I wanted to do this webcast and the main reason I wrote the book about winter cycling is because I wanted to show people, one, that riding your bike during the winter time is possible, first of all, and secondly, that it can be a lot of fun. Uh, that if you have the right clothing, that if, if your bicycle is equipped properly and you have a few basic skills like how to ride properly in ice and snow, that winter cycling is really not a problem. So, um, yeah, that's my brief introduction to how I got into, into winter cycling and, and why I wrote the book. So, um, I'm going to sip some tea here. So yeah, um, tonight I'm, I'm not going to cover everything that's inside the winter cycling book. Um, I'm going to touch on some of the bigger, more important topics so that maybe you can get started if you, if you want to. And if you want to learn more, you can check out the, the winter cycling book. Um, but uh, I, I'm going to be talking about some of the main topics. So, and, and after I talk about these, if you have any questions... Uh, you know, that go off into other areas, that's fine. Uh, I will help in any way that I can. So, um, the first thing I should mention probably is that there are different types of winter cycling. Uh, depending on where you live in the world, uh, winter cycling is, is going to vary quite a lot from other people in other parts of the world. For example, growing up in Southern California, winter to me meant cool temperatures, but didn't necessarily mean uh, riding in rain, ice, snow, etc., or or even freezing temperatures. Um, somebody that lives here in Utah, like I do, uh, in the mountains of Colorado or anywhere in the world, uh, we're dealing with uh, cold temperatures, below freezing temperatures, oftentimes, and ice and snow on occasion. But most of the time, the roads are clear, and and you can ride in the street or on sometimes on bike paths. Then there's this whole other breed of winter cyclist who is cycling in ice and snow and slush on a regular basis. And they basically have no roads on which to ride their bike. So um, winter cycling can vary greatly. And, and that was one of the obstacles that I had uh, with writing the winter cycling book was I had to differentiate between the different types of winter cycling. So in the book, I break it down into three main categories, which is the warm weather winter cyclist, which is, would be like someone that lives in California or Florida or something, or Arizona, uh, where, where it gets chilly, but it doesn't necessarily freeze, and there's n no ice or snow on the ground. Then there's the cold weather winter cyclist, who is riding in temperatures that are below freezing. So the warm weather is basically above freezing, cold weather winter cyclist is below freezing. And then finally the third category of cyclist is the off-road winter cyclist who's navigating their bike through ice and snow. On top of that, there are different types of cyclists. Um, just in the same way that there are mountain bikers and road bikers and, uh, in the regular cycling world, there are different types of winter cyclists as well. So there are people that uh, ride generally like road bicycles during the summertime and these people want to ride during the winter time as well and in in the book I call these people sporty cyclists so they're even in the winter time wearing tight-fitting clothing they're concerned about their speed um, but they're also just like any other winter cyclist concerned about staying warm and comfortable and safe on their bike 
Then there's the athletic cyclist, who is less concerned about speed and is more concerned about staying warm and safe and getting to their destination uh, in a reasonable amount of time. And I would consider myself an athletic cyclist. Um, if you saw any pictures of me that I posted on Bicycle Turn Pro this last year while I was bicycle touring across Eastern Europe, um, you'll see that I'm wearing basically like regular snow or ski pants. I'm wearing regular snow or ski style jacket and I, I even sometimes have a, a beanie or a face mask or something like that that you would see on a, on a skier or a snowboarder. So this is the athletic cyclist, someone who's uh, more concerned with safety and just remaining comfortable on the bike, not necessarily getting to their destination in a record amount of time. And then finally there's the casual cyclist, and this is someone who, um, excuse me, uh, cycles maybe to work, um, to go and visit friends or something. The casual cyclist is extremely popular in Europe. Um, I lived in Krakow, Poland for a while and you would see cyclists everywhere during the winter time. Didn't matter what you know what the weather was like, uh, what time of year it was, there would be people riding their bike to work, to their friends, to restaurants, etc. And this is the casual cyclist, someone that wears jeans probably on their bike, um, is more concerned about the way they look and where they're going than the cycling itself. Um, so those are the three main types uh, of categories that I cover in the book of different types of cyclists. Sporty cyclists, athletic cyclists, and casual cyclists. So you combine that with like the three different types of winter cycling, warm weather, cold weather, and off-road, and there's this big grid of like nine different types of winter cyclists. And um, and so one of the tricks to winter cycling is figuring out where you fit in that grid. Are you a are you a casual cyclist in warm weather conditions or are you a sporty cyclist in off-road freezing cold temperatures? So um, I, that really is like one of the first steps to uh, determining like what kind of clothes you're going to be wearing and all that kind of thing. So um, I'm not going to talk too much more about those nine different types of cyclists. Um, but it is important to understand that, that the clothing and the gear that you use on your bike and stuff is going to vary depending on which type of cyclist you are. Um, no matter which type of cyclist you are, here I'm going to unzip a little bit, see I'm getting hot, another, another secret to winter cycling, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. But um, the, the, main, the main secret to winter cycling is this. You don't want to sweat. Um, that's the main thing. During the summertime, you get hot while riding your bike. You're physically exerting yourself. The sun is shining. You're climbing big hills, and you get hot. And your body sweats in order to cool yourself down. And that's great during the summertime. But during the wintertime, sweat is your worst enemy. Uh, if you sweat during the winter time, yes, you get cooled down, which for the moment might be great. But the problem is during the winter time, it's very hard to dry off uh, after you get wet or after you start sweating. And so, if you start to sweat on your bike and then you get cold uh, and you are unable to dry off or get warm in any way, there are a whole bunch of dangers that that. Um, occur because of this and you can really get yourself in a huge amount of trouble. So this is really the number one secret to winter cycling is you don't want to sweat. And you do this in two specific ways. One, by altering the clothing that you're wearing at any particular time. So for example, before I, I had that big hat, silly hat on and I was getting hot and, and I don't want to get hot because you get hot and then you sweat and when it comes to winter cycling you don't want to sweat so I took the hat off. This is basically uh, what you have to do on a regular basis while cycling during the winter time is you regulate your body temperature through the clothing that you're wearing. So if you're if you're too hot you take clothing off and if you're too cold you put clothing on and you can do this not just with a hat 
but you can also do it with the um, clothing that you're wearing up top. So um, I'll talk about layering in just a moment, but you'll have multiple layers on when you ride your bike. And so if you start to get hot, you take one layer off. Get cold, you put another layer on. And, and you can layer your upper body. You can layer your lower body. You can even layer your hands a little bit and your feet um, and your face. So um, that's the first way that you regulate your body temperature and prevent yourself from sweating is you change your clothing. The second way is you change the speed at which you are cycling or your physical output basically you change your physical output so if you're if you're going really fast and you're starting to sweat you might simply need to slow down in order to regulate your body temperature or if you're getting cold you might try to push yourself up that next big hill that you encounter in order to in order to boost your internal temperature so um, those are the two big things. You want to change your clothing and regulate your speed. Uh, I mentioned layering a second ago. There are three main layers that you want to have uh, when you are preparing yourself for a winter uh, bike ride. There's an insulation layer. A <laughs> I'll talk about insulation layer first before I mention them. So the ins insulation, uh, the base, uh, yeah, insulation layer is like this one. That I'm, uh, I don't know why I started with insulation layer, but uh, insulation layer is your middle layer. Uh, let me start over. I'm going to start with the base layer because that's probably, I should start from the inside out. The base layer. Um, your base layer is like the jersey that you wear close to your skin. And um, for your base layer, you want something that wicks moisture away. So if you do start to sweat a little, it takes that moisture and gets it away from your body a little bit. You want a base layer that dries quickly and allows some airflow. You don't want it to be like a, a wetsuit that you would wear in the, um, you know, in the ocean that causes you to sweat. Um, so a base layer is usually pretty close to like your generic cycling jersey. You don't want to wear, like I'm wearing a cotton t-shirt right now. This is not a good idea to wear during uh, the winter months because cotton gets wet and it stays wet. And uh, like I said before, you don't want to get wet during the winter time. So there's the base layer. Then there's the insulation layer, which I mentioned before. Uh, this would be a good example of an insulation layer. This is a fleece jacket from Patagonia. And uh, the, the insulation layer is basically there to keep you warm. Um, fleece is a popular choice for an insulation layer because it can even get wet and still keep you warm. Um, so yeah, that's your insulation layer. And then finally on top of that is an outer layer, which I'm not wearing at the moment, but um, your outer layer is like a rain jacket basically that is put on over your insulation and base layers in order to uh, keep you dry um, and protect you from the elements. So rain, snow, hail, whatever um, is going to be uh, kept away from you by wearing an outer layer that sheds that kind of thing. So a waterproof jacket of some kind is what you want um, for your outer layer. And and like I mentioned before, um, the the base layer, the insulation layer, and the outer layer are generally uh, when you hear people talking about that, it's generally for your upper body. Um, and this is mainly because your your body's internal organs are all in inside your you know your chest and stomach cavities and uh... these are the areas that you need to keep those organs warm in order to to uh... continue cycling and stay happy out there on the road um, your lower body doesn't have any you know those internal organs in them and therefore uh... many winter cyclists don't layer their lower lower body in the way that they do with their upper body um, for example, uh, during my bicycle tour last year across Ukraine, I was simply wearing uh, an outer layer on my, you know, my lower body. I was just wearing basically a pair of waterproof ski pants. Um, and on my upper body, I had all three layers. Um, so, so that's another thing uh, to take into consideration when you're purchasing uh, winter cycling gear is that you might not necessarily have to buy uh, an insulation layer especially for your lower body so um, that's all I'm going to say about layering your clothing 
Um, I'm trying to go fast because there's already 20 minutes here. We've already taken up. Um, winter tires and equipping your bicycle. Uh, I'll talk about that next. Um, one of the main problems about cycling in the wintertime, especially in cold weather winter conditions, is that uh, once the temperature drops below freezing or even near freezing sometimes, uh, the ice and water and snow that's on the road uh, freezes and the, the road surface becomes incredibly slippery uh, for, for almost any type of bicycle. And so what you want to do in order to continue riding safely during the wintertime is you want to increase the amount of traction that you have with the road. Traction is basically your ability to grip the road surface and continue riding without slipping or sliding. And there are five different ways that you can alter the amount of traction that your bicycle has with the roadway. Excuse me. Um, so those five ways of altering the amount of traction that you have is by one, uh, increasing or decreasing the pressure uh, of the air that's in your tubes and tires. Uh, secondly, you can change the type of rubber or rubber formula that's used on your specific brand of tires. So you can change your tires, essentially. Uh, different tires have different hardnesses or softnesses to them. Um, you can change the tread pattern on your tire. Third, that's the third thing. Um, you can change the suspension or lack thereof on your bicycle in order to uh, increase or decrease your traction. And you can change your posture or your general ability to ride a bicycle properly. So those are the five things. Um, let me go back and just discuss a few of these. Uh, inflation pressure of your tires. During the wintertime, you generally want to decrease the uh, pressure in your tires just a little bit. Um, and if you're going it through deep snow or something, a lot of these new fat uh, winter bikes and stuff have, a, have really big tires, uh, and I'll talk about that later. Um, but the, the amount of pressure in there is decreased. Um, which which allows more of the tire basically to hit the road surface, and this the more tire that you have hitting the road, the greater your traction basically. So you you want to decrease your tires, uh, the pressure in your tires just a little bit. Uh, rubber formulas. So yeah, there uh, a lot of people in the bicycling world don't know this surprisingly. People in the motorcycle world know this extremely well. Uh, for, I, I drive a motorcycle, for example, and every time I go to get a new tire on my bike, they ask me, what kind of tire do you want, a soft tire or a hard tire? And a hard tire allows you, uh, basically, you can go further on a, on a hard tire. The rubber is harder, and therefore it doesn't, uh, what's the word? <laughs> I'm blanking on the word. The, it doesn't wear down as quickly. It, it, uh, softer tires, however, grip the road surface more and allow you, especially on a motorcycle, to go into the turns. Uh, they grip the road more so you can turn a lot more. And um, the problem with a soft tire, though, is that they, they wear quickly. So um, it's, it's the same for a bicycle. During the summertime, you might put a hard tire on your bicycle in order to go fast and, and get a lot of wear out of that uh, you know, out of that particular tire. In the winter time, however, you want to be using softer tires because they grip at the road surface more and provide you with more traction. So, um, if you go to your local bike shop and you ask them for soft winter tires, they'll help you out. But sometimes, like when you look online, it's really hard to tell what the specific rubber formula of any given tire is. Um, tread on tires. This is probably the main thing I wanted to talk about in regards to traction. When it comes to tread, um, when you're riding on like a flat road surface, like on a road or touring bicycle, you actually don't want any tread on your bicycle tires at all. Because um, when you're riding on a flat surface, the tread really doesn't do anything. Um, the, a flat tire is going to grip at the road surface better than one with tread on it, actually. But when it comes to winter cycling, when you're uh, cycling on specific types of ice and snow, you want a tire that has big, fat 
widely spaced apart tread because this uh, type of tread allows you to grip at the road surface and for large chunks of snow uh, especially to be thrown out of the tire as you ride. If you have a uh, thread that's, uh, yeah, tread that's uh, <laughs> too close together, that's, you know, really, really narrow, snow gets caught in there and it doesn't come out and then basically you're just wasting whatever tread would be on your tire. So you want a tire that has tread that's widely spaced apart. Um, the other thing that I should mention when it comes to tread on your tires is that there are now specific winter cycling tires uh, usually called studded snow tires and these are specific types of winter uh, winter bike tires that have metal cleats uh, in them so, sometimes dozen, you know, dozens and dozens of metal cleats uh, in the exterior of the tire and these cleats work similar to the, tr the regular rubber tread except that they protrude down into stuff that regular tread wouldn't be able to normally stick into such as ice and certain kinds of snow um, and and there's hundreds of these different types of studded snow tires but um, the, one of the things I should mention is that uh, with these tires usually the more studs that are on them the more they are made to go in off-road conditions so some of these studded snow tires have almost no studs on them at all and these are meant more for riding on the road um, but they can handle a little bit of off-road ice and snow then there's some of these studded snow tires where the whole tire is just covered in metal and these things are made to go off-road uh, on ice especially um, and in snow so there's those uh, types of snow tires as well and also uh, when it comes to tires wider is better during the winter time like I mentioned before a wider tire is going to hit more of the road surface and therefore increase your traction um, it will decrease your speed a little bit at the same time having wider tires having uh, less pressure in your tires having more tread and more of these studded snow tire you know spikes on your tire all that stuff is going to decrease your your speed a little bit, but it increases your traction and overall safety. So um, there's that. Uh, again, I'm trying to go through this kind of quickly so you guys have time to ask me any questions that you want. Um, yeah, so that's tread and traction and all of that good stuff. Um, I'm just going to talk very briefly about a few little tips for riding in, in uh, winter weather conditions and then I'll open it up to Q&A and you can ask me any specific questions that you want. Maybe something that I glanced over or, or something else uh, completely non-related to winter cycling. So, um, riding in the winter time. One of the things is, well first of all, riding in the winter can be just as fun as riding at any other time of year so keep that in mind I think I think a lot of people think winter cycling has to be some miserable you know freezing cold adventure through the snow but the more that you cycle in the winter time just like the more that you do anything else in life um, the more comfortable you get with it and and now like I've done so much winter cycling that I don't even think about the weather outside like it doesn't matter almost what the weather is going to be unless it's storming like crazy I probably won't ride but but on any other day I don't think about really how cold it is or or what the road conditions are going to be like because I know that I am one properly equipped with my body you know with my clothing and my bike and and that I'm mentally equipped as well I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges of winter cycling is just mentally uh, getting to the point where you are comfortable in these various conditions. Um, that said, there is a much greater chance of you crashing your bicycle during the winter months simply because it is so slippery. Um, most winter cycling crashes are self-caused, not caused by a car or something crashing into you, but simply caused by you making a mistake during your ride. And that's usually a mistake by not properly equipping your bicycle but in more instances than not it's usually just you simply making a dumb mistake on your bike in the way that you ride. Uh, most winter cycling accidents are caused when you are coming to a stop like you try to stop too quickly and your rear tire skids out and then you're on the ground. 
um, or going around a turn is is the other major accident that's caused during the winter time. You try to go around a turn too quickly, like you might in the summertime, for example, and your bike slides out, and and then you're on the ground. The good thing about crashing in the winter time, though, is that generally you are covered up a little bit more than you would be during the during the summer months. Like you're wearing pants, a jacket, long sleeve jacket, even a face mask or something like that. So that when or if you do crash. Uh, the injuries that that you might uh you know have afflicted to your body or whatever like aren't aren't nearly as bad as what they might be uh during the summer months so that's kind of an awesome thing like i've crashed my bike especially just testing things out for this book um i've probably crashed my bike two dozen times during the winter time uh in all sorts of conditions and i've never been hurt more than just a little scratch or something on my uh, arm or leg. So um, that's kind of cool. Uh, and yeah, and yeah, if you fall into like snow or something, it's usually, it's oftentimes pretty soft. So yeah. Uh, that said, I, I hope I didn't scare people away from winter cycling. One of the things, uh, another major strategy to riding your bike in the wintertime is that uh, on some occasions, the best move to make is not to continue cycling but to simply get off your bike and walk around or over the obstacle that you're encountering. I was riding with a guy recently who tried to go uh, you know, basically through a uh, pothole that was in the road and we couldn't tell how deep the pothole was and he insisted on trying to ride through this big thing and of course he uh, fell a little bit and you know, uh, he was fine, but but it was just a dumb mistake. Whereas when I saw the pothole in the road, I thought, I'm not going to chance it. I'm just going to get off my bike and carry my bike around this thing because I don't want to get hurt. And 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 that's what he should have done as well. So um, that is one of the the strategies to winter cycling. Is sometimes you have to get off and walk. Um, there are certain types of obstacles uh, in the winter time that you can encounter where you, in the summertime maybe you would be coming towards this obstacle I'm going to try to yeah you're coming towards this obstacle and you might want to just do a quick swerve around it during the winter time or during the summertime in the winter time that quick little swerve to get out of that obstacle's way might cause you to slip and fall and so uh, sometimes the best strategy is to ride straight through the obstacle that you're encountering so rather than you know turning the direction of your bike you ride straight through this thing um, that's another strategy for riding your bike. Um, the last thing I guess that I want to say is um, a lot of people when I start telling them about winter cycling and stuff they, they are under the impression that there are like some magical bicycle tires or uh, any type of bicycle really that will allow them to cycle in deep snow. And the truth is if you're if you're riding your bike in deep snow and especially uh, well the truth is that people riding their bike in deep snow are generally riding in the track of somebody who has gone before them so uh, usually when you you know like there are these uh, fat tire snow bikes and stuff or even if you're riding on a mountain bike a traditional mountain bike um, you are going to be riding your bike in the tr in the tracks of another cyclist uh, a car of some kind, a snowmobile, or possibly a cross-country skier. This is where you ride your bike. If you are the first person breaking trail in deep snow, you aren't going to ride. No matter what type of bicycle you're on, even these fat snow bikes are not going to be able to necessarily break through uh, deep, powdery snow uh, on their own. So if you're that first person breaking trail, you're going to probably be walking your bicycle. Um, and the person will, behind you <laughs> will be able to ride. So, um, yeah, that's it. Uh, gosh, I, I, I tried to go so fast, I don't feel like I covered as much as I wanted to. Um, there's, so, there's so much more that I could talk about when it comes to winter cycling. Uh, I covered a few of the basics just now. Um, in my book, Winter Cycling, which you can learn about at wintercyclingbook.com, I also talk about the dangers of winter cycling, uh, hypothermia, dehydration, etc. 
uh, how to deal with those situations if you encounter them and how not to ever encounter them, which is probably the smarter step to take. Um, I talk about knowing when it's safe to ride. There's a five-step safety assessment that I give in the book to uh, help you determine whether you should ride your bike on any given day. Um, I talk about the best winter cycling fabrics so that when you go to buy a jacket or something uh, you have an, an idea of what to look for and what, what fabrics to avoid. Um, I talk about uh, yeah the best clothing items for your specific type of winter cycling. I give examples of how to dress uh, based on uh, yeah what type of winter cycling you're doing and what type of cyclist you consider yourself to be. Um, what else? I talk about the different types of bicycles used for winter cycling. Uh, road bikes, mountain bikes, fat tires, snow bikes, etc. I talk about how to protect your body, your bicycle, your gear from the snow, ice, rain, dirt, and stuff that gets all over your bicycle, so how to protect your bike from all these things. I talk about lighting and visibility, what kind of lights to use during the winter time, how to make yourself visible to cars and motorists, uh, how to keep your water bottles from freezing, how to bicycle tour if you want to do a big long bicycle tour like I did during the winter months. I talk about indoor bicycle trainers which you can use during the winter months to ride your bike indoors and stay in shape or prepare for races or whatever else you might want to be doing. Uh, I talk about how to clean your bicycle uh, and a whole lot more. So um, if any of that interests you, uh, go to www.wintercyclingbook.com check it out. Uh, it's also available on Amazon.com. Um, just go to Amazon and type in winter cycling, click enter, and there you go. Uh, so that's it. That's all I have to say. I'm going to open it up to uh, Q&A now. So if you have a question and you'd like me to answer it, uh, go on to Ustream here where we're broadcasting. There's a chat uh, board off to the right of the video. Um, and you can ask me a question. I'm not quite sure if you have to uh, create a Ustream account in order to ask me a question. Maybe. Um, hopefully not, but maybe. And uh, yeah, so ask me a question. I see some people have asked questions already and I will start going through those. Let me just get some more water. My throat is like <sighs> talking too much. And it's getting hot in here. getting hot. Take this off, Darren. Jeez. Okay. So, first question is, what would be a good rain jacket? Uh, I knew someone was going to ask this question, and, and, and it's actually something that I kind of avoid um, simply because the rain jacket that you use depends on the, the conditions that you're going to be cycling in. Excuse me. Um, but also, and more importantly, what kind of rain jacket is available to you in your specific part of the world. Um, people tonight are watching from all over the world, so it's hard for me to recommend one product that might be available in one part of the world and isn't available in the other. Um, and, and again, it depends what kind of cyclist you are because um, and what your goals are. Uh, I, I, for example, just ride in a regular sort of like a hiking outdoor jacket usually that you could get at any sort of outdoor um, you know sporting goods store or something uh, it's got a Gore-Tex exterior which makes it waterproof water resistant etc um, and and yeah that's pretty much what I use as my main uh, exterior cycling jacket but Again, that's not going to work for everybody because maybe you're a sporty cyclist who wants to, you know, more of a road racer or something. You wouldn't wear that type of jacket. Um, so again, that's why in my book I kind of talk about the different types of jackets and stuff that should be that could be worn, and the different types of fabrics that are that are used. But I don't necessarily recommend a specific type of jacket. Um, just because there isn't like one go-to jacket that's the best and and I think a lot of people think that there is something out there like that that they don't know about that there's like some magical winter cycling clothing that 
you know is best but it, it there isn't um, and these clothing styles change every six months um, so it, it it's more a matter of fabric choices than anything else and, and again I, I talk about the various types of fabrics used in winter cycling jackets inside the winter cycling book um, so it's just a matter of picking the right fabric um, does salt take a big toll on your bike, chain, cassette, etc.? Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why inside the Winter Cycling book I devote a whole chapter to cleaning your bicycle and also to fenders and mud guards, which are used, uh, mounted on your bicycle and used to protect your bike from these corrosive salts that are laid down in the streets during the wintertime. Uh, because salt, yeah, can, can really tear up the paint and stuff on your bike, which then causes it to rust and a whole host of similar problems like you said your chain and cassette can get in really really bad shape during the winter time if you don't take care of it properly um, so yeah like that's the first step is like putting fenders or mud guards on your bike that's the first step to protecting yourself the second step is cleaning your bike frequently and for many people that means after every single time that they ride because if you're riding through like ice or snow or something or on these streets where they're regularly putting down uh, salt or gravel, your bike is going to get torn up and destroyed if you don't clean it on a regular basis. So yeah, um, yes. Uh, studded tires are pretty expensive. Have you ever tried to stud your tire yourself? If so, how? Um, it's true. These metal studded snow tires are expensive. They generally start around 80 US dollars and go up from there. There's some as much as $200 a piece or more actually. So you could be putting $500 tires on your bike uh, just to get you through the winter time. Most people aren't going to need to do that um, but they those tires do exist. Um, and um, Ben Joba is asking, have you ever tried to stud a tire yourself? And the thing is, yeah you can and people do do this. I have not done it. Um, I I, I guess I haven't gotten to the point where I felt like I needed to do this. Um, but you can take almost like uh, the cleats that are put in track tires, like people that run track and field, like you can put these sorts of cleats uh, into regular rubber bicycle tires and use them as a sort of impromptu studded bike tire. And it does work. There are ways to do that. Um, I haven't done it though, so that I guess that answers your question. You can do that. Um, and there are a, a whole number of other bike hacks that people use. I mentioned one in the winter cycling book about using zip ties that you can get at a hardware store. Putting zip ties around your regular rubber bicycle tire and using that as a sort of increased traction mobile or something for your bike tires. So that's another way of doing it. Um, Heated grips, like on my motorcycle, would be nice for bicycles. Yeah, that would be nice. It'd probably be pretty expensive just because of the battery power and stuff that you'd need to do that. Um, you know, a lot of cyclists will ride simply with these chemical warmers uh, that you can get at any outdoor store um, in their gloves. So that's one way to do it. The other way, uh, again, this is something that I mentioned inside the Winter Cycling book, is that you can ride with a pair of what are called pogies. And these are basically uh, like neoprene covers for your for your bicycle handlebars. That these are they're basically like big oversized pockets that go over your handlebars, and you slide your hands into them while you ride your bike. And basically, these covers um, protect your your hands from freezing while you're on your bike or getting cold, at least. So uh, a lot of people that ride in, especially like uh, freezing cold, off-road conditions, are riding with these pogies on their handlebars. Um, and pogies are very similar to, uh, like you you mentioned on motorcycles. Motorcycles have like wind protectors over the handlebars. Even you know for riding during the summertime, you have this wind protector kind of over the handlebar to keep your hands warm uh, because you're generating so much wind when you're on a bike. And this that's essentially what these pogies are is like wind covers for your hands but they also help to keep out cold ice snow etc so um, those are an option for a lot of winter cyclists um, what else where are you heading on your next bike tour 
Well, my next bicycle tour will not be a winter cycling tour, um, as much as I like cycling in the wintertime. My next big bicycle tour is going to be uh, through Europe. Um, I currently have a... I, I realized when I got home from my latest bike tour that uh, I've been through more than half of the countries in Europe. I think there are 50 countries in Europe, or 52, 54, something like that. And I realized I've been to way more than half of those um, on my bicycle. And so I got this idea in my head like, ooh, wouldn't it be cool to like ride my bike through every single European country? So um, next year, what I'm going to be doing is riding my bike. Uh, I'm going to start in Poland in May, mid-May. I'm going to go to Austria for a little bit, then come back to Poland. Then I'm going to ride through a small part of Russia, um, Lithuania, Belarus, Latvia, Estonia, Finland, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. Kind of going around the Baltic Sea a little bit. So that's going to be my next big bike tour. And immediately after I finish that, um, I'm going to fly from Copenhagen, Denmark to uh, Taiwan and do at least a month-long bike tour there. So I'll be, I'll be gone on the road for at least six months and maybe more. Um, depending. So that's going to be my next big bike tour. Um, and I'll, I'll be talking about that more on BicycleTurnPro.com in the months you know, to come here. I'll be sharing what I'm packing, how I'm changing some of the things I'm packing from my previous tour, uh, a whole bunch of things like that. So, Because every single bike tour that I've done, and I've been doing these for, what, 13, 14 years now, it, I change something, uh, change my clothing, change my gear, uh, and sometimes I do that because the stuff I was using previously wasn't the best, but usually I just do it to try something new, um, and so yeah, I'll be doing a, a bit of that on my next bike tour. Um, any tips on camping in the winter time? Yeah, um, during my bike tour across Ukraine and Moldova and all that, I spent a lot of time camping. I was pretty much camping the whole time. And um, it's cold, I'll tell you. Um, I, I talk, there's a whole section in the winter cycling book about camping during the winter time. So check that out, first of all. Um, but there's a few things about camping in the winter time. One, I wouldn't recommend it, first of all, to most people. Um, I think. Uh, that before you do a wintertime bicycle tour like I like I've done, um, you one need to be comfortable bicycle touring during the summertime. <laughs> so you have to be good at that first. First, secondly, you need to be comfortable uh, cycling during the winter time, just regularly, like on day rides or something. So you got to be good at those two things before you even attempt to go on an overnight camping winter time bicycle tour. Um, so that's really like my first thing. Uh, secondly for winter time camping, it helps if you can uh, light a fire each night and and that's because oftentimes your clothes will become wet. Even, as much as you try, especially your, your base layer, your, your like jersey or whatever, is gonna get wet while you're riding throughout the day and at the end of the night you want to be able to dry that out. And if you if you go home or you stay in a hotel or something, that's not a problem. Drying out your base jersey or your insulation jer uh, base layer, insulation layer, etc., is not a problem. But if you camp and it's freezing cold outside, uh, that base layer may never dry, and you can get yourself in huge amounts of trouble if you are riding in wet clothes for days on end. So. Um, being able to light a fire at night is is probably a big thing. Um, you know, there's other ways to dry your clothes. For example, when I was in Ukraine, I was stuffing all my clothes into the bottom of my sleeping bag so that my body heat throughout the night would would warm my clothes. And so when I woke up in the morning, I pull my previously wet clothes out of my sleeping bag, and they'd be relatively dry. Um, and so I wasn't starting each day, you know, freezing my butt off basically. Um, so that's another thing. It also depends on you know winter your winter cycling conditions where you are. Like I was using a three season tent in Ukraine, 
because it was freezing cold outside, yes, but there wasn't snow, um, like deep snow or anything. So I wasn't having to worry with like my tent collapsing from three feet of snow falling on me or anything. There are four season tents built for winter snow conditions, and if you're in that kind of environment, you probably will want a four season tent. Um, these four season tents um, are designed for winter, and they block out more of the wind uh, and cold than a three season tent does, but they don't have as much ventilation, so you got to be careful about the humidity and stuff building up inside the tent because um, otherwise you wake up and there's like rain falling on you, which isn't a good way to start the day. Um, four season tents are also steeper than three season tents, so that when during uh, snow, you know, when when it snows, the the snow will fall off of a four season tent, whereas a three season tent it might pile up on you and then, you know, you're buried alive inside your tent. So, um, yeah, that's all about uh, camping. I, I could talk a lot more about that, but how do you keep your manhood warm? <laughs> I've frozen my nuts when winter cycling. Oh, dear, that's funny. Um, <laughs> again, uh, I talked about, like, these three different layers that you use um, you know, to keep your upper body warm, but the same is true with your lower body. And it sounds to me like you weren't layering your lower body as much as it needed to be. So uh, there are like special uh, base layer uh, underwear that you can use that are kind of warmer than your average underwear. Um, I'd probably recommend something like that. Um, but yeah, wow, I've, I, I, I mean, I haven't heard of that. The other thing is like you don't want to sit on a frozen uh, bicycle seat. Um, so keeping your bike indoors or keeping your seat covered overnight um, is really really important when it comes to cycling in the winter time because that's probably like the fastest way to freeze your nuts off <laughs> is is to uh, you know sit on a frozen seat uh, right away. Um, have you ever towed a trailer uh, during the winter? No, and I don't necessarily recommend it, um, as, unless you're cycling on paved roads, in which case it doesn't matter all that much. Um, but if you're talking about cycling in snow or something with a trailer, I wouldn't do it. Um, do you know using a trailer even off like off road during the summer months can be hard enough, but doing it in the winter is kind of crazy. I just wouldn't wouldn't recommend it. I'd go with a two wheel rig for sure. Um, how do you keep your feet warm and dry? Uh, yeah, this is another big topic again covered inside the winter cycling book, wintercyclingbook.com um, is well one, wearing the right kind of socks and, and what I mean by the right kind of socks is the right thickness, the right material because the material is very important just like the material in your base insulation and outer layer is important same is true with your socks. You don't want something that's gonna, you know, your feet are gonna get wet and then your feet freeze. That's that's usually happens like if you wear cotton socks, your feet are gonna freeze on a wintertime bike ride. Um, so it's it's a matter of wearing the right kind of socks, uh, then the right kind of shoes on top of that. So um, a lot of you know summer shoes have vents and stuff in them so that your feet don't overheat. In a winter cycling shoe you don't want that as much. You don't want cold air rushing into your into your feet area. Um, you want to avoid that. Um, instead you want a closed sole shoe usually that's waterproof because uh, when you stop your bike or you, you're going to be walking through snow or puddles or anything um, you want a shoe that's not going to get wet the, the instant you put your foot down on the ground. So the the main thing though uh, uh, about shoes is you don't want a shoe that's going to cause you to overheat and sweat because because like I said before the your number one goal during your winter cycling exploits is not to sweat is to stay comfortably cool that's the way I like to put it not warm but comfortably cool so you want to stay your feet to be comfortably cool uh, while you ride. If that's not enough, like if you have a if you have the right socks, you have the right shoes on, and your feet are still cold or they're wet, um, there are additional shoe covers that you can use to to uh, to ride in, and 
these are probably not for everybody. I think most cyclists can get away with just a, a proper shoe in most instances. But if it's really cold or it's raining or snowing, then you are, might want to go with a waterproof shoe cover that goes over your shoe and protects, protects your feet from cold, rain, ice, and snow. So, yeah, shoe covers. Uh, let's see. Um, I've only got about four more minutes here, guys, so I'll answer as many as I can, and then I'm going to have to go. I totally just spilled. <laughs> um, anyways, how do you protect your face and eyes from the cold? Another good question. Um, excuse me. Uh, yeah, so this is how you do it. You wear sunglasses or goggles uh, to protect your eyes. And it's really, really important during the winter months because, uh, one, you're, it's cold outside and you're creating your own wind as you ride your bike. And that wind going across your eyes can blind you very quickly. Um, and you can suffer really severe, long-lasting damage to your eyes if you aren't careful. So you want to be wearing some kind of protection for your eyes, sunglasses or goggles like the ones I just wore. There are These are regular just snow goggles that you would see a skier or a snowboarder wear, and this is what I usually ride in. There are special goggles just for cycling, which are usually like narrower, and they look a little bit more like sunglasses. Um, but they're, I, they're kind of overpriced in my opinion, and really no different than something like this. So... Um, but but they do the the difference between goggles and sunglasses is sunglasses um, allow air in on the sides and snow and stuff can fall in and then you're like constantly wiping them and trying to keep them clear whereas goggles um, create there's a barrier that's created between your face and the outside world and keeps help that basically helps to keep all that rain and snow and stuff out um, so yeah uh, in regards to protecting your face. If you um, have seen any of the pictures of me that I've posted of me cycling across Iceland or Switzerland or Ukraine or whatever, um, you probably saw me wearing a full face ski mask where only my eyes were visible. And this is a very light, thin mask. It's not thick in any kind of way, but um, that's generally all you need is something very, very thin. Um, to protect your face from the wind, usually, that's being created. It's, that's really more than anything else. It's protecting your face from the wind. Um, and there are a number of these uh, different types of masks that can be worn. There are some that just go across like this part, part of your face, whereas the top would be exposed. There are ones that go just over your nose, and then there are ones like the ones that I have that just go over everything except for your eyes. So... Um, it depends again on how bad the winter cycling weather conditions are and you know uh just personal preference more than anything else but but that's the two main things to protect your upper body is you want to have a lightweight face mask that goes over you and probably a set of goggles um i'll mention really quick like one of the, the problems with wearing sunglasses during the winter time is well one like i mentioned the stuff comes in from the side but if you wear a face mask and a set of sunglasses, what happens is because your your mouth and nose are covered by the mask, the air, uh, the hot air that you're breathing basically, comes up out of the face mask and then goes into your sunglasses, causing them to steam up and basically blind you. You can't see where you're going. So um, if you choose to wear a face mask, to keep your face warm or protected from the elements, you generally have to wear a face mask like this because this will stop that warm air from coming in and fogging up the glasses. So, um, yeah, just that's an important thing to say. Uh, dude, you're living the life I want. Thank you. <laughs> I try. Uh, do you carry weapons with you, firearms? And, and assume I, um, I'm guessing you're talking about on my bicycle tours, do I carry a weapon? No, I don't. I, can, I have a knife for like putting peanut butter on my bread and stuff, which I could use as a weapon if I wanted to. But no, I don't. And um, I've, you know, I've bicycle toured all over the world, and I've encountered guns in the past. You know, people with other guns. 
um, this last year riding through Africa and stuff. I I'll just tell the story. It's kind of funny, but like I was riding through the South African country of Lesotho, and I was looking for directions. I was trying to find the right road, and and I was on this really crowded street with people bustling all around, and I just saw this guy who uh, who I thought he looks like he might speak English, and he looks kind of like he knows what he's doing. So I approached him really quickly on the bike, pulled up, kind of hopped the curb, and and surprised him a little bit. And he turned around, and when he turned around, I realized the guy was uh, stacked with guns. He had a pistol in like his vest pocket. He had another, uh, basically like a like an AK-47 style gun at his side. And the three guys behind him had guns as well. Um, this was like a small African gang, basically, that I had suddenly steered into. Um, and so this is one of many instances where I've encountered guns and stuff on my trips. But, but the, the thing is, like, I've never been in a dangerous situation in 14 years of cycling where I felt like I needed a weapon myself. The guys had guns, but they, had, they weren't interested in me. Uh, I spoke to them just as I would be speaking to you right now and said, hey, like, how's it going? And, and I'm looking for this particular street. Can you help me out? And I basically just tried to ignore the fact that these guys are carrying 20 different weapons over f four people. So, <laughs> you know, um, but, but, but to be honest, I've never encountered a situation where, one, I would need a weapon, or two, would have had the time to have pulled it out and used it. Most uh, bicycle touring scenarios where things go bad happen very, very quickly. And, um, yeah, so, no, I don't have weapons. That's the short story. I don't know why I went into this big gun thing, but, but no. Uh, any passport or visa problems at borders? No, I've never had problems. Uh, uh, I mean, I have had border guards bribe me for money, but I've never paid them. And... I've had issues where, like I was in Transnistria, I cycled from, yeah, I was trying to go through Transnistria, and I wanted to spend three days cycling across Transnistria. And when I got to the border, I had to fill out some paperwork to get a visa to go across Transnistria, and I put that I wanted to be there for three days. And when I handed it in to the guy, he said, no, 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 no three days, one day, one day. <laughs> you know, I, I basically had to get across Transnistria in just a couple hours. And so that uh, little things like that where it, it wasn't a big deal. I was still able to do what I wanted to do, but I had to change my plans at the last minute. And that happens a lot on any adventure. Like you, you create a plan, you try your best to follow the plan, but sometimes that doesn't happen and you have to improvise. That's part of the fun of bicycle touring. So, uh, yeah. What do you use for health insurance abroad? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head. I had, I've had i tried different things over the years, and I don't know. Uh, I'll have to find that out. Uh, how do you handle doing your laundry? We're, we're past uh, 8 o'clock now, over an hour now. I'll, I'll keep going for a little bit, guys, um, just because I want to answer as many of your questions as possible, but um, I'll have to go in maybe 10 minutes or less. Um, what, where are we here? How do you handle doing your laundry and you in a wilderness area? Well, one, laundry is a matter of uh, opportunity. You know, when you have the opportunity, you do your laundry. That's basically it. Um, and sometimes that means doing it in a machine. If you're lucky, uh, sometimes it means just washing your clothes in a bathroom sink, which is often. Uh, sometimes that means you know, using a river or something to wash out your clothes. Um, there is no secret, really, to laundry. It's simply a matter of find water, wash your clothes, and dry them before you need them. Uh, yeah, so um, that's it. I don't know. Uh, since the snow tires are so expensive, would it be better to have a front or a rear tire studded? Probably the rear tire, but um, I really would recommend if you're getting studded snow tires, spend the money on both, because um, otherwise you're kind of just, it's almost not worth it, really. Um, probably the person that buys studded snow tires is wants them because they're riding in an extreme condition that requires studded snow tires. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, never carry a weapon at the border. Uh, let's see. Uh, Wool jersey as a base layer, uh, as a layer. Yeah. Um, do you recommend wool jerseys as a layer? So yeah, wool is probably one of the most popular winter cycling fabric types um, because it keeps you warm, it can get wet a little bit, and still keep you dry, which is an important thing. Um, and yeah, so wool is definitely a uh, recommended uh, fabric type. And wool is used in a lot of base layer clothing items, so the layer that's like kept close to your skin. Like uh, wool socks are extremely popular during the winter months um, because, like I said, they're warm, they can get a little wet and still keep you dry. Uh, they're relatively comfortable. Some wool is kind of itchy, um, so it depends on what kind of wool you get. Um, but uh, yeah, wool is great. Um, yeah, do you speak? Do I speak any other languages? Uh, not really. Uh, I kind of. I you know I've been through dozens of countries, and I and while I'm in these countries, I try to learn a little bit of each local language. So this last year, I cycled through. 24 countries and probably spoke 16 or so different languages, uh, you know, on the across those various countries: uh, Icelandic, Turkish, Bulgarian, Romanian, Ukrainian, Polish, Slovakian, Afrikaans. Uh, you know, those are just in the last year. I probably know a few words in each of those languages. I uh, could have a conversation in German, Spanish. Polish, maybe, um, but other than that, I probably sound like a idiot when I speak in any any language, um, and I just try to pick up a few basics. Um, if you go to bicycletouringpro.com and type in like language, I've written a bunch of articles about how I learn languages, um, how I've learned German basically just by bicycle touring, um, and uh, yeah, so there's there's a bunch of articles there, and also some articles there about which words I recommend you learn um, first when you're trying to learn a language. So that's it. Um, I think that's it, guys. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you learned a little something about winter cycling. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, go to my website at www.wintercyclingbook. Dot com and uh, pick up a copy. It's available in paperback and uh, as in ebook format, so for a Kindle, iPad, etc. Um, it's also available on Amazon.com. And yeah, thanks so much uh, for tuning in. If you guys have any other questions, you're always able to email me. My email address is contact at bicycleturnpro.com. The website again, bicycleturnpro.com. And the Winter Cycling Book is available at wintercyclingbook.com. I think I covered everything. Uh, thanks so much. Have a good night, everybody, and have a fantastic winter. I hope you get out there and ride a little bit. Adios. Avidazain. Dovidzenia. Ciao. Bye.